My name is Bob Limbeck. Um, I'm a, I was the watershed scientist for Del the Delaware River Basin Commission. Um, I just got, I just put in 30 years now. So, um, but prior to that, I was a environmental scientist title. I was, uh, I used to be the water use specialist. I used to track all the water suppliers in the basin. So I have uh, good basin geography knowledge, but I've been doing biology and water quality monitoring since uh, early 90s uh, on the Delaware River primarily and tributaries to the Delaware River. Um, I've worked all over the basin, however. I mean, uh, I've had contracts with the state of Pennsylvania to do a lot of their biological monitoring. Um, same thing with Jersey and Delaware and New York. Uh, so, been around a lot. Um, but this is primarily to do with uh, one of the programs that I manage at DRBC um, the Scenic Rivers Monitoring Program, which takes care of our um, special protection waters uh, rules. Um, how many, anybody familiar with special protection waters? Okay, very good. <laughs> Preston, I, I'm, I'm sure you are. Okay. Well, special protection waters rules, um, our main goal uh, with the Delaware River upstream of Trenton is to maintain existing water quality. So we're, this is an anti-degradation based program, which is uh, kind of uncommon. I mean, you look around here, um, everybody's dealing in the TMDL world where water quality has gotten so bad that now you've got to lift it back up again somehow. We don't want that ever to happen uh, north of Trenton. Um, there are some streams that are impaired for various things, but that's no matter to us. Um, so what we've done is gone in, um, defined existing water quality uh, with best available science. And once we find out what those levels are, we define them statistically, and we don't want them to change beyond a certain level. So the Special Protection Waters Program through our project review section reviews permits, um, talks with all the uh, towns and, and sewer districts and everything to design their treatment facilities such that measurable change to existing water quality will not occur. So we want, it to, in order to, we want them, to, them to design their plants so that it keeps water quality good, where we found it good. If it was bad, then you know, you've got the whole state TMDL process that takes care of bringing it up to standard level. Um, my part of special protection waters is slightly different. I, I was tasked with not only defining or creating a baseline of existing water quality conditions, and we did that in the lower Delaware from 2000 to 2004, but now to find a way of assessing whether measurable changes have occurred to existing water quality. Um, so we went through our first cut from 2009 to 2011 of coming up with an assessment method. And these are all like regulatory terms that we're using is no measurable change. What is measurable change? Um, so we had to lay that out is what does measurable change really mean? Um, and how do, you, how do you assess it? And uh, so in the lower Delaware from 2000 to 2004, we went site specific with our existing water quality. So at certain points along the Delaware River, might as well just get going with the slides. All right, so start with the National Wild and Scenic Rivers. Um, kind of the reason why we decided to protect rather than restore. Um, the Delaware River is Upper Delaware, Scenic and Recreational River. The middle Delaware is the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. And then President Clinton declared the Lower Delaware, sections of the Lower Delaware in the Wild and Scenic System um, in 1999. There's a management plan for the Lower Delaware. And the first goal of the management plan is um, 
to protect water quality and to improve it where practical. DRBC is the body that uh, helps to try to maintain or achieve that first goal of the Lower Delaware Management Plan. So, um, you know, the drainage area of the Scenic Rivers Monitoring Program, uh, about 6,780 square miles to Trenton, okay. Um, we monitor about 200 miles of river. Actually, we go all the way up to Oquaga Creek now, so about 220 miles of river. Um, and all the tributaries. So, and this monitoring program is a partnership with the National Park Service. So there's people, um, Alan Ambler um, has been with the National Park Service in Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, has done our sampling for us in that park. And then there's um, Don Hamilton and Jamie Myers and Jessica Newburn and a number of other people that take the samples for us in the upper Delaware. Um, and then DRBC monitors up to the Delaware Water Gap. And when Al needs help sometimes, we'll, we've monitored as far up as about the Flat Brook. So, um, so I've, I've had, geez, probably about 150 interns over the years that worked on this project. Um, this is a, a long-standing, long-term project. Um, in 1992, they took all the available water quality information for the upper Delaware and for the middle Delaware and defined existing water quality in our rules. So you can go into our rules and actually find water quality concentrations that we say we don't want water quality to get any worse than this. We, so we put those numbers in our rules. Um, but only on a reach wide basis and not for all the tributaries. So um, once we figured out that we could do it on a site specific basis in the lower Delaware, we decided, okay, we're gonna go up here and go site specific up there as well. And the product, the other product I'm gonna be pre previewing today is the existing water quality atlas of the Delaware River, <coughs> which is site specific from Oquaga Creek all the way down to Trenton, all the tributaries coming in too. So it's like 30 some locations on the river itself. And then um, I think it's about 60 more sites. Um, we only did tributaries of greater than 20 square miles, except for in some, uh, uh, some, some other instances where uh, people wanted a stream studied. Like we have Pidcock Creek, which is smaller than 20 square miles, but Bowman's Wild, Wildflower Preserve wanted us to define EWQ there, so we went ahead and did it. Um, there's some streams like Pontecussin Creek in Bucks County that were designated as wild and scenic along with the lower Delaware. Um, it's only about seven square miles, but we went ahead and did EWQ for that as well. A uh, couple of other streams that are smaller than 20 square miles we've done as well. So we're not averse to going in and defining existing water quality for those either. Um, also, if a project's coming into DRBC, like if somebody wants to discharge to a stream like up here in the northern part of the Lower Delaware was uh, Slateford Creek, which is Northampton County. It's just south of uh, the Water Gap. There was a discharger who wanted to discharge in there, and we didn't have any existing water quality for that stream, so we went ahead and uh, did it over a three-year period. So this my job is just to cover all the, as many streams as possible in the Delaware and try to protect them all as, at whatever water quality level we find them at a, as of a certain period. Hello. Okay. All right, so terminology. Here's the lower Delaware. I want to make sure I didn't skip slides. No, oh, we're good. Okay. So here's the lower Delaware. Um, and if you work in New Jersey, they call the lower Delaware the tidal section below Trenton. So don't listen to them. This is the lower Delaware. Okay. So from the water gap, um, our northern point Entering the Lower Delaware would be at Portland, and then we monitor at the Calhoun Street Bridge at Trenton, and monitor all the water quality going by that spot, all the water quality going by that spot, and look for the differences between them. So, and water quality is very different from here all the way down to here. So, um, the sites on the river 
are interstate control points. And a control point is basically a modeling term. If, you know, you're always trying to set your boundary conditions in a model or something like that. But we've got water quality model for the lower Delaware. So they call these control points really as um, sites where we choose to monitor that um, we can actually predict water quality eventually once we get enough monitoring done uh, using our model. Um, so interstate control points or any interstate streams um, boundary control points are all of the tributary monitoring points, like there's a Pequest River, um, the Pollenskill, Martins Creek, the Lehigh River, Bushkill Creek, Pohack Kong, Musconet Kong, Cooks, Tinicum, you know, all of the, as many streams as we could get all the way down to Trenton. So those are boundary control points. And then we also have a, uh, a biological monitoring program of the Delaware River itself that we try to fit into this longitudinal pattern along the river. And just, if you just want to know where our biomonitoring sites are, they're kind of close to a lot of the control points as well. So we could actually establish biological conditions as well <coughs> using biological metrics. We haven't done that here though. This is strictly chemical water quality. So the designation for the Lower Delaware is uh, significant resource waters. Um, there's also outstanding basin waters, which are um, basically no treatment plants are allowed in outstanding basin waters. Significant resource waters are um, a stream we want to protect, but we still allow dischargers in there. But they're going to have to meet certain criteria in order to be able to discharge. So. Um, so Lower Delaware has designated significant resource waters in recognition of the fact that it's good quality, but it's still a working river. So here's our policy for anti-degradation of existing water quality. No measurable change in existing water quality except toward natural conditions and waters considered by the Commission to have exceptionally high scenic, recreational, <coughs> ecological, and or water supply values. Um, we wrote a background report for that designation. It was accepted by the DRBC commissioners and the governors. Um, but then we had to go back in, make sure you define this quantitatively in some way. And the big job recently has been to assess whether this has occurred. No measurable change. And um, those are nice terms to put in a policy, but eventually they have to come down and, you know, where the rubber meets the road. So where we're working here isn't necessarily where most of the uh, states are. The states are just really wiped, just wiped out by having to do TMDLs all the time. It's a very ex expensive, a um, lot of uh, legal problems, all kinds of fights going on. We don't ever want to get to that level in the lower Delaware because ex existing water quality is still good. So we want to keep it there. Protecting it, we figure, is a hell of a lot cheaper than having to restore it. That said, there's a few things we're still going to have to restore. We do have some pH problems. There's mercury um, impairments. Um, but for other water quality conditions, it's really in good shape. Um, I swim it all the time. <laughs> but Where do the mercury impairments come from? Ohio Basin coal plants. For mining stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's basically air deposition from the Midwest. Okay. Uh, when you discover changes in the existing quality, what's your role at that point? Well, my role is a technical role. Um, I make recommendations for policy, but once the politicians get a hold of it, you know, what's going to happen? So, <laughs> um, and I uh, thankfully have kept out of that realm as much as possible. Uh, they still employ real scientists at the RBC, and that's what I want to stick with. So, what about new threats like uh, medications that are turning up in the water, caffeine? Stuff? Yeah, we we have a um, a toxicologist at the RBC who studies who studies emerging contaminants. His name's Ron McGillivray, and um, he's done some surveys. Um, most of his surveys have been in the populated portions of the basin, which is really the estuary and the Philly region. Uh, Northern Delaware. So he does a lot of work there um, on particularly like the pharmaceutical products. 
Um, but he's done some surveys uh, north of Trenton, which is kind of my area of operations. I don't work in the estuary very much. And we've got a lot of people that work in the estuary, and then there's me. So <laughs> um, I'm all alone. Um, so yeah, we, we do study them. Um, if there are um, the possibility of developing um, criteria for those, we do that. We, like, lately, we've been studying um, using native mayflies to assess like, mixes of pollutants. And um, which may contain, uh, recently we studied based on fracking material because we were worried there was going to be fracking in the Delaware. So we went ahead and um, tried to see what all that flowback water did to native mayflies in actual toxicological studies. Um, but we also do it with just basic, um, you know, we could take just plain old Lehigh River water and see what, what it does to sensitive mayflies or the other more common taxa that are used for toxicological studies. Um, this isn't tox work. This is all ambient water chemistry, defining baseline conditions, then comparing how that changes and how it's influenced by other factors over time. So you can dive into a lot of different specialties here. And there's, uh, so here's our methods. Um, we do have a quality assurance project plan that's EPA approved. And anybody that's doing any chemical monitoring and you want to um, really state your goals of, and what sort of quality of data you want to provide and how you're going to go about doing that, you need to file a quality assurance project plan. Uh, EPA reviews it and approves it. Um, and if you want an example, QAPP, ours is free to download. And it shows all the details of exactly how we monitor what we do um, and what methods are used, what detection limits we're uh, trying to achieve, all that. So um, just a basic thing you want to do in any water quality study. And uh, I think ours is a, a pretty good example of that that could help people that are interested in studying water quality and actually setting objectives for study objectives, so how, what they want to study and how they want to go about doing it. Because you can study water quality, but um, if you don't know what you, exactly what you want to do with it, you can miss a lot of steps along the way. And part of this talk is lessons learned of things that I screwed up along the way. So, um, so we do 22, basic, 22 parameters. Um, what I call conventional parameters, your, your alkalinity, hardness, chlorides, uh, total dissolved solids, total suspended solids, turbidity. Uh, there's nutrients that we do. Uh, we do bacteria, uh, fecal coliforms to go with Pennsylvania's rules, uh, Enterococcus with New York's recent rules. They have Enterococcus standards now, and E. coli. But we do all three everywhere we go to be able to assess using the state's methods, wh whichever state we're monitoring in. So, because yeah, Jersey's got E. coli rules. And EPA is actually recommending everybody goes to E. coli for recreation assessment now. Um, and then the basic field parameters that we take, dissolved oxygen, the percent saturation, um, pH, specific conductance, and temperature, um, both air temperature and water temperature. And then we do uh, flow monitoring with every sample. Without flow, you're missing a lot of the water quality picture. It's the most influential variable upon water quality. A lot of water quality parameters are directly related to flow. And if you're not monitoring flow, you're missing the boat. So, and uh, Flow monitoring can get very expensive if you try to do it all yourself. Um, and then we also do various quality assurance type of samples. Um, our most common are, are uh, replicate samples, um, field blanks, um, sam sample equipment, rinse eight blanks. Um, but then we also do, we'll do split samples. We'll do other types of, uh, lab within the laboratory as well, there's all kinds of blanks that are used. What kind of help do you get with flow monitoring? Do you say you <laughs> we do it ourselves? <laughs> uh, we did it ourselves through 2009, and then we decided to go with a, a cheaper way to do it. And that's I don't want to seem ignorant, but how do you do your flow monitoring? Uh, well, the USGS goes out, sets up stakes on either <clears throat> side of the stream. You okay. calculate the whole cross-sectional area of the stream. Um, with each, you go out with a velocity meter and a depth stick, and that's usually combined on a weighting rod. 
um, and you go across the stream, break the stream into 25 or 30 increments. You don't want any one increment to be more than to represent more than 5% of the flow. So if you're doing it in a small stream, you're still doing it like every two or three inches maybe. Okay. But you don't want more than 5% uh, of the flow represented in any one of those cross-sectional spots that you're measuring. Okay. Then you just add them all up with velocity and area and you're looking at the volume going yeah, to calculate the volume going by, yeah, in cubic feet per second. So, um, so yeah, through 2009, we had crews going out and trying to maintain gauges on all the streams we're monitoring. Um, we've got 88 stations in our network right now. And really, one guy with a bunch of interns, <laughs> it just raised all kinds of problems. And every rainstorm, there's a lot of streams that are really... Um, unstable so after every rainstorm the channel changed and you have to do the rating all over again because the rating is just a regression relationship yeah after, after doing years of that did you correlate that with gauge stations that usgs maintains yes. that show instantaneous flow and yes say that if you do a csm a cubic feet per second per square mile yes how close are you and can't you just use that after you right well that's the, the thing we were we were trying to achieve the same standard that usgs meets right and we were killing ourselves trying to do it so we ended up talking to marla stuckey from the pennsylvania geological survey who's developed regression relationships using gauge data to, to monitor ungauged sites. So now all we do is monitor water level and correlate those water levels with her model. And we've, we've got really, except for in some cases like where there's dams or where there's, uh, there's always exceptional cases. But for the most part, we're, we're like, with, without having to go out and measure this, we're still getting like 99% accuracy and replicability. Um, so yeah, it's part of the lessons learned. Very good, Preston. You're way ahead of me. <laughs> so the first product that we're, we're previewing here is not available yet. It's still in review. It's been in review for basically two years. Um, now I'm trying to get this out, and, and once it is out, I think I'm going to be doing a lot of road shows, and particularly for the watershed groups, because I've got a chapter for each tributary as well in this. So if you want to know about the Lehigh River, I could go to any monitoring group that's active in the Lehigh River and talk about what we found there. Um, so but you're not the school building, this is the school bill. This is a method that could be a, employed in the Schuylkill. Yeah. Now that the Schuylkill's a river again, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, this is something we could do and I think would be we'd be very effective if we did it. But you don't have any Nothing, nothing specific for the school bill or any of its tributaries are in this report. No. Right. No. Okay. And, and can you access it from, the, from a database? Or? I, have, I have a database. Um, the database is available. Um, sections will be downloadable, like for each stream. All the samples we took at any, any given stream will be available. And everything is now available either on the National Water Quality Data Portal or from Storet. Um, all the data is in there now, but uh, we're going to actually, we've got our own little mapper uh, app that we have on our, on DRBC's website that's going to have, um, yeah, we've got a mapper on DRBC's website that's going to have the, you know, it'll have the, uh, the chapters available to download, the data available to download for that stream. And as, as well as other things like watershed statistics, flow statistics at that site, all kinds of uh, population uh, trends, stuff like that. So. All right, so in our uh, objective to assess measurable change, the definition in our rules is uh, an actual or estimated change in a seasonal or non-seasonal mean for protection waters upstream of 209.5, which is Delaware Water Gap or median for special protection waters downstream of river mile 209.5. Why we have both of those in there? Because one was defined in 1992 using traditional statistical analysis tools where the mean was the thing, the geometric mean and all that. Well, then we realized, well, hell, a geometric mean is nothing more than an estimator of the median. 
And um, most of the water quality data we have is not normally distributed, which is an assumption that has to be met for means. So by using medians, you get rid, out of, you get rid of all those outliers that, that influence your mean so much. There's, a lot of, there's always a high value or really low values that influence your mean all, all the time. And it can throw, throw it off, basically. Um, if you use the median, you just make sure you take enough measurements to get good confidence bands. So it's all end driven. Um, so we figured out that we needed 30 to 50 samples to define existing water quality so that the 95% confidence interval of our median matched up with about the 45th or 55th percentiles so that you get a nice tight band that you're measuring. So you can be confident that you're, the ballpark that you're looking at in water quality there is representative of that stream. So if you take too few samples, you could be way out. So too few samples, you're gonna have a really tight, a really wide band on your, on your data. If you take enough samples, that band next down, next down, next down, so you're f really pretty confident that you've got water quality conditions nailed down. Um, that said, there's still a lot of other variables that play on water quality data. So the assessment that we did, um, first thing we did was went out and de defined existing water quality. We set our baseline. We call that EWQ, right? So that's uh, 2000 to 2004, we did it in the lower Delaware on a site-specific basis. So there's 20 parameters that we assessed at the time. 24 sites, that's 440 assessments that we did here. Um, we chose five graphical plots to examine in order to, uh, to make a call on whether water quality changed. So for each parameter at each site, there's about five plots we did. So that adds up to about 2,200 analyses. But then you realize there's things that are messing you up in there, right? So if you're looking at flow, you have to check that your, freq your, the, your frequency, like your data distribution stuff. Um, you have to check whether the data is normal or not. Um, you have to revise the graphic display just to make it easier to see stuff, so scaling and all that. So you have to play with every graph in order just to get it to, to display right, right? Well, that took about another 1,800 plots. So, if you're wondering where I've been for about the last three years, I've been <laughs> cranking away like a factory job with this. Um, so it was, it was not automated. I'm, I'm old, right? Um, a kid could have come in this with, with the R pro program and probably done it in about 20 minutes. But um, I ended up looking at all these individually and, and basically setting them by hand so that you could see everything. Um, so everything, you know, everything's formatted properly, scaled properly. Uh, everyone's individually interpreted. I spent time on each interpretation. Um, and I used the Analyze It um, Excel add-on as my statistical program. Um, it's, a, it's a nice program, but it almost never gives you the graph that you really want to see. It'll give you a graph, but it's going to be whacked out in some way. <clears throat> So you, you have to go in and modify every one of them, really, just to, to work with it right. Um, so all, of, all, of, all of these data are available for me, or they're all in the Storet WQX data system, or it can be found also in the National Water Quality Data Portal through a, a mapping program. Um, and for the next assessment, I'm converting this whole process to R code, now that I'm learning R, which makes me happy. Um, so the various tools we use for each site to classify each of our sites, we use USGS Stream Stats. Some of you were in that session with the, about the tools to, to work on your site. Stream Stats is fantastic. Uh, it's a USGS run um, program. You zoom down, uh, shows the, the exact pixel of the part of the waterway that you're studying delineates the watershed for you, and then uses all these regional regressions to calculate flow statistics for that site. It'll give you all the basin characteristics for that site, like uh, percent forested, percent urban land cover, um, percent carbonate bedrock. Uh, gives you uh, 
percent impervious cover. Um, so all those came out, went into a database, and then I used those to feed the USGS Delaware River Basin Base Program that Marla Stuckey developed for us. She put out a publication for Pennsylvania, uh, a base model, and it's a, it's, it's a base flow predictor, basically. It uses gauge data to calculate flow statistics for ungaged sites. And um, it's really good, but there's tricks to playing with it. Um, but you take stuff, you take various facts out of stream stats, plug them into that model, and it feeds you back basically a, a flow duration curve for your site to, to know what the range of your flow is and what the, what the chance of exceeding that flow is any given day. So what we do is um, take our water quality samples and plot them on that flow duration curve to see how well our water quality data covered the flow regime. Um, did we get sa enough samples at high flow? Did we get enough samples at low flow? Did we capture normal or median conditions? So then I can classify my water quality data by, all right, my data best represents the summertime low normal condition of flow conditions. And that's important with your water quality data. Um, again, we're talking about the gauge discharge relationships of going out and taking flow measurements all the time. We did that through 2009 and then abandoned it in favor of using base. And base, if you use a local gauge to estimate your flow, um, it's really good because you want to be able to capture all the, the thunderstorms and things that are in your area. Sometimes base will pop up and give you a gauge in, you know, you're trying to do Tohicken Creek and it's popping up with a gauge in New York State somewhere. It's a great R squared relationship in, according to that program, but it also gives you options of streams of gauges that are closer by that are almost as good R squared. And they're the one, those are the ones you want to use when you're using the base model. Because um, then you know that you're getting all the same uh, events going on, the hydrologic events. And then, um, Again, I talked about using the analyze statistical add-on for Excel. Um, I'm not going to. I'm going to be using that a little bit, but not so much anymore. We're moving all to R, which is a freely available, um, open-source statistical package. Uh, it's very powerful. All right. So these are the, diff the two different study periods. We've got the EWQ period, which is our baseline. We've got the post EWQ period, which was 2009 to 2011 for the lower Delaware. So normal flow at Trenton is about 10,500 CFS, right? So in the various years that we went out monitoring, the summer flow, so this is May to September. That's our, our monitoring period is May to September. We only monitor during that critical low flow period um, when we expect water quality conditions to be at their worst. Um, so we can't afford to go year round as much as I'd like to, um, but we, we monitor intensively. We monitor, uh, twice a month, whereas like the WQN network in Pennsylvania, that's a quarterly, sometimes they go monthly, but most, for most of their sites, it's quarterly monitoring. So you get one sample per season. Um, we go out at, every two weeks during the summer and get 10 samples in that May to September period over a course of a few years that ends up giving us a good enough end to be able to classify water quality good. Um, but this is, you know, look at the, the variation of the various flow conditions we sampled, some really dry years and some really, really wet years, okay? There's really no such thing as normal. There's, we got really one or two normal years out of the entire period that we studied. So, so again, flow is important. Um, so these are the five plots that we used. Um, there's a scatter plot of concentration versus stream flow. Um, the, an, an annual plot, just, just plot our, plots our samples annually to see the changes through the years. The box, po box plot comparisons, which are common statistical comparisons of P EWQ versus post EWQ period. Uh, cumulative distribution function, which compares the data over their entire distribution. It's, uh, they're like curves that if you see a shift in that curve at certain um, probabilities, you'll know whether you, the changes in your data occurred under um, 
at low concentrations or at higher concentrations you, so you could see the shits. If you've looked at like pebble counts and things, there's, it's a similar distribution function that's used to compare the data. And then the statistical test we used for comparison of medians, it was the Kruskal-Wallis test, which kind of just matches right up with the box plot. So, so I was able to see conclusive results for most of the data, where this is an obvious shift. And this is the plot against uh, concentration versus flow. And this is chlorides at Martins Creek up in Northampton County. So between the two periods, chlorides look to have rose by about a little over five milligrams per liter between the two periods. The slopes are identical. And both of them are significantly related to flow. And so the R square there tells you how much of the variation in the data can be explained by flow. So um, even a, you know, a lot of times you're looking for an R square for certain applications that if you want greater than 0.6 to say, yes, this is a real true relationship. Well, even if it's less than that, it still tells you that it's, it's explaining a good part of the variability. So it's still, even at 0.4, it's still pretty good. All right. Um, it's just telling you that there's other variables at play here too. It's not just flow that's influencing your data. Um, but so being able to plot against flow is really good. So you can see how the, the clouds, the blue cloud and the red cloud, if you plot them all together, you wouldn't really say anything's, anything's really different. But by plotting against flow, you could see that the clouds really shifted. Okay. So in this case, both, both time periods, we found good flow relationship. We found uh, that degradation was evident by that upward shift in the lines. Um, there were no detection limit interferences over the entire period of study. Um, a lot of the parameters of detection limits changed from 2000 all the way through 20, 2011. Um, in this case, there were never any non-detects. So there was no interferences there. Um, there was a comparable end. Uh, we took uh, like 40, 40 to 45 samples for the EWQ period and then uh, 30 samples in the post-EWQ period. And that's good enough for a real comparison. Um, and they, you can see by the length of the line, the lengths are equal. We, they represented the same range of flow conditions as well. So all of those can really interfere with a, a conclusive result. So what we're trying to do is just account for variability, natural variability here, which is what science is. Here's one that wasn't certain, okay? Um, this is ammonia at uh, Nishisakwe Creek in Frenchtown, New Jersey. Um, it's not flow related at all, neither parameter, they're basically bad. Um, we can't say that there was any degradation evident it's different enough. These clouds are different enough that we think ammonia did decline, but there's other things that may be interfering here that, that can't get us a strong conclusion. So what we can say is, well, no degradation, no degradation is evident, but it could have been something else other than um, real water quality changes going on here. Could have been, and might have been, different detection limits. Yeah, I mean, it looks like yeah. All see all the these guys? Oh, yeah. wait. Right. Detection. Yeah. Detection That's all detection limit problems. Right. And early on, that was the best we could do with ammonia, was get down to that level. Okay. But um, since then, we hired the Academy of Natural Sciences and uh, the New Jersey State Health Lab to uh, do the, the more recent samples. And their detection limit is way down there. There's our detection limit there. And they were all detects. I mean, I think we had two non-detects in the entire data set. But even, even then, I don't know how you cannot say that there's a statistical difference between those two data sets. That's what you think. Yeah, that's what we think. We're, we're pretty sure of that. But in terms of drawing a, to satisfy the politicians, you're going to have to account for all these guys. Because they're, you know, you're going to get the, uh, the Hall brothers come in and say, whoa, but that's, you know, you're really seeing, we think there's a big improvement, but 
we're not going to say so definitively. All we're going to say is no degradation occurred, which makes us happy. So these data sets were a little mess. This day, all we're really saying is this data set was a little messier than this data set. That's all. So uh, here's the annual concentration plots. Um, if you look at them, they kind of look the same. Oh, this is the chloride. This is the one that shows the upward shift. Sorry, I'm getting, yeah. I'm confusing myself. Really? Yeah, it, there is an upward shift. Yeah, slight yeah, I think, but we may have done it, that 2009 data. This, yeah. There's wider variability here than, than there is in this year. So this is the low flow year. This is the lowest flow year. You're going to get high, wider variability during low flow years because the conditions are more changeable. Um, I mean, dilution is a solution to pollution, right? Um, dilution does have effects. But it, it's still um, a nice something for looking at to help explain your data, right? Um, and there's a the cumulative distribution function. Again, it shows that shift. Here's the EWQ data. There's the post EWQ data. And pretty much at all um, probabilities, at the low concentrations through the high concentrations, there's shifts all along the line. So that's pretty definitive for me. Uh, and then you got the box plots. Everybody's kind of used to looking at these. There's your median. There's the confidence intervals of the median. There's the 75th percentile, 25th percentile, and your max and min. Okay, and you're just comparing two data sets. And then, um, so, and it comes up with statistics. This is what analyzes, spits out for you. And at the median, we had about a three milligram per liter uh, was a significant measurable change statistically. But then um, you kind of have to put things into a, a greater perspective as well. 21 to 24, Everybody in, throughout the entire East Coast would be happy with 21 and 24 milligrams per liter of chlorides. New Hampshire's got TMDLs for chlorides right now where, you know, it's in the hundreds, okay? So we are, this, Martins Creek is a good regional background stream for, for chloride. It did go up, and we think it was because of road salt. Um, we monitored some nasty winters, right? Or there was some nasty winters before we monitored, I should say. And um, that, those chlorides were still leaching into the stream from May to September. And um, you know, they get in the groundwater and just gets into the base flow. And you'll see it throughout the year, pretty much. Problem with chlorides is it, it'll go down during the months. Like so from May, to, May through September, it's real high in the winter. And then you get the rains in the springtime. It brings the concentration down. And it's going down a little bit more through the summer but it never quite gets down to where it used to be. So you'll add more chlorides next winter and it pops up even higher and it goes down and pops up even higher and goes down. So chlorides are a big issue um, throughout the whole northern US, uh, road salt. And so we're, we're trying to uh, start work on a chloride reduction strategy before chlorides get too bad to start actually impairing aquatic life and stuff. And then there's the, the statistical test when it spits out for you. Um, says, yes, there is a difference between them. So um, here's the key to our matrix. So the green is no indication of measurable change. The red with the two stars in it, we found measurable change to a more degraded status. And then there's, we had like a weak indication of measurable change occurred. So there's the entire for every place we studied. So the blue ones are river sites, Trenton. There's Pidcock Creek in Pennsylvania, where only E. coli went up. Um, then the Jersey streams are in green here. Lock uh, Wikichoki, Lakatong. Uh, hell, can't even hardly see it. Yeah, Nishisakawik, Muskinet Kong, Pahak Kong, Pequest, and Palmskill. 
So um, these are all the streams that we studied, and these are the results of the entire study um, in one matrix. Seeing the relationship between the rock type and Rock type? Yeah, like in the protected area of the shales and sandstones versus. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Um, we do have the streams all classified, and it's really uh, limestone is really the only one that pops everything out. The conductivity. I mean, conductivity was one that went up almost everywhere. Chlorides went up almost everywhere, and E. coli went up from French Town South. So we're, good, we're doing a bacteria track down in the watersheds here, and then try and come up with a chloride and conductivity strategy, which these are too close, they're very closely related. Yeah, those are basically the same yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, chloride is a major component of conductivity. So one of the major ions that's in conductivity. And uh, I'd say for just plain old stream monitoring, just tracking along a stream, conductivity is cheap and it's easy and it's really conservative and it's great tracer. Problem is you don't know what substances are producing that conductivity. So the, basically just went over all these. I'm gonna try to hurry up a little bit more. Um, we made recommendations to adopt the EPA recommended recreation standard for E. coli, but keep enterococcus and, and um, fecal coliform Fecal coliform is still a good like historical indicator because with Pennsylvania having used fecal coliform for years and years in their water quality standard, we wouldn't want to abandon it. But E. coli is really the better tracker for recreation conditions. Um, we are supporting U.S. stream gauges as much as we possibly can because they're super important. The work that USGS does with their stream gauging program and all the continuous monitoring that they put out there is critical and USGS is cutting stream gauges all the time because um, they just can't afford them. Um, the RBC is increasingly propping up, prop, propping up a lot of stream gauges, using a good portion of our budget to do it because it's just that important, um, especially I mean, for long term monitoring. <laughs> um, so, we're going to try to find ways to reduce chlorides and conductivity before it come, becomes a problem and then. Um, we don't really know what um, conditions are really like between October and April. The states don't really sample often enough to see those real seasonal patterns yet. So um, I've actually proposed that we pick a few sites to monitor year round intensively to see um, what real seasonal changes are. And we, we ourselves are putting out a lot more continuous monitoring equipment. We've, say, you've got continuous yeah. Monitoring. We put out uh, hobos for conductivity and temperature right. all over the place. And for chlorides and, and specific conducting Yep, the cheap, cheap little hobo, yeah. and it works great. So we, we do have quite a bit of that going on. Uh, all right, um, in our monitoring program, these are some of the lessons learned from uh, where I saw, saw myself as having screwed up over the years, okay? Um, I let Tom Fixlin talk me into, into cutting my frequency for some sites because we couldn't afford to do all the sites one year, right? So he said, go out, go out and do these sites monthly instead of uh, bi-weekly. And it made it so that I couldn't see any changes going on at all. 15 samples was not enough to be able to do what we intended to do here. So we needed 30. So I want to keep it at bi-weekly. If we're going to monitor, do it bi-weekly. If, if you can't afford it, you have to cut the site instead of cutting the frequency. Um, we're going to continue to use this base model. We found it really works well. Um, and it's, it's free, so that's a good thing. Um, we had four different analytical laboratories that we hired for our monitoring, which the RBC being um, a sort of a non-governmental governmental agency. Um, we, weren't, we aren't married to one lab where like Pennsylvania has to send everything to their Harrisburg lab. Um, we, are, we have to go through a bidding process for our labs. Um, and it turned out that when I first started this program, I didn't know much about laboratories and ended up hiring a wastewater and milk lab my first year and got all non-detects and wondering what, what did I do wrong? You know? So I wasted a lot of money that first year. 
And so you need to find a lab, if you go to monitor high water quality, good water quality, you need to find a lab that can get down there on detection limits. Um, so anytime we change labs now, we have to conduct split sampling to see how the labs compare to one another too, because it did change over time. We got better and better and better as we went on in terms of being able to monitor water quality conditions. Um, so that was a lesson learned um, that could have saved a lot of money if I knew it right up front. Plus, I mean, the laboratory methods themselves have gotten better and better. Laboratories have gotten better and better through the years. It's just the methods themselves have gotten better. So, and we went through some changes over that time. So, um, going to automate the assessment, going to do bacteria track downs, uh, verify these, this nutrient drop that we saw. We think the decline, we don't know whether it was natural or due to management actions. Possibly special protection waters has been effective in knocking down nutrient concentrations, but um, distinguishing that from, from natural background changes, um, we, we can't do that right now. So, and then we added more sites uh, since we completed the study. So we've added Slateford Creek, we've added the Delaware River at San Seti, and Pohatcong, or I'm sorry, that's Low, Low Patcong Creek in, New Jersey, in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. We've added those since we finished the study. Um, right now we're underway with uh, Hockey Ho Cake and Alexaukin Creek in New Jersey, as well as Cherry Creek up in the uh, Delaware Water Gap. So we're trying to pick up all watersheds of over 20 square miles. So there's our sites. And um, we're not gonna have time for it. I was gonna actually open up some of the chapters to show you uh, each individual chapter if you're interested in a particular stream, but I, we don't have time for that. So I went and talked too much. <laughs> uh, but those are all our sites. When you download the presentation, if you're interested in any particular stream, I will send you the chapter. And hopefully it'll be available for download uh, very soon. The other product we've got is an atlas of all of the existing water quality from top to bottom throughout the Delaware River. Um, this is in review also. Um, it's due out this summer. It's got, not going to need as much review because there's not a lot of uh, policy in it. It's really just displaying what we think is existing water quality as of, as of whatever time periods we monitored. Um, so, but it does have a lot of useful information for anyone interested in studying any stream that's tributary to the Delaware River down to Trenton. Um, there's 84, 84 locations. Um, overall, 28 Delaware River sites and 56 tributary watersheds. And we, um, we may end up pulling our existing water quality tables out of our rules and just using this document as a guidance document um, for EWQ because it's going to display, putting this entire document into our water quality rules would put, you know, 250 more pages into our water quality rules, which I don't think is really necessary. But it's going to have, it's got watershed maps, uh, watershed and flow statistics from stream stats and base, um, all the existing water quality tables. So you'll be able to find con expected concentrations of every parameter that we studied. Um, it's going to be a pretty cool product. And there's just sample pages, the watershed maps. We've got the dischargers, like that one's uh, West Branch Delaware River at Hale Eddy. So it's a big watershed area. So it's lots of dischargers in it. Um, the EWQ table, and then all the watershed facts. Um, we're working on some other projects. Um, told you about these that we're adding. Um, we're also doing confirmatory monitoring for the Flat Brook at Flatbrookville, uh, Basket Creek, New York, and Little Equinox Creek, Pennsylvania. Um, this is just sort of cleaning up our EWQ inventory of uh, some of those tables are in the book, are at present are just placeholder pages. Um, so once I get these all cleaned up, these will all be added to that book. Um, the next big measurable change assessment is going to be from the upper, middle, and lower Delaware. And we're going to use the 2018 to 2020 period for that. Um, all this stuff's going to be available on our map service, our inter interactive mapper. Um, and we also are using the R, R uh, programming language along with another package called Shiny um, to produce 
uh, a data explorer for the, low, for the Scenic Rivers Monitoring Program. And right now, this is John Yagachik's app that he did for the estuary called the, the Boat Run Explorer. And it's all of our water quality data since like 1960 um, for the estuary. And it, you can show it you know, by month, by river mile, uh, all the wa different water quality parameters. Um, I'm working on getting all of my biomonitoring program data uh, available um, on our website. Um, we've been taking macroinvertebrate samples since 2000 in the Delaware River and uh, uh, algae samples as well since 2006. I'm um, working to get all that into a, a downloadable format where you can actually look at all the different species and counts and uh, biological metrics that we calculate. And um, we also, in 2013, did a mussel survey of the Delaware River that if you're interested in freshwater mussels, um, we've got a publication available on our website for that. So there's me. And these are my bosses, John Yagachik and Tom Fixlin. Contact any one of us, and you get a, all this stuff. Um, I think, well, if you want to talk to me at any time, anyone, um, welcome. I've got cards, and, and please contact me. I'm happy to answer anything.